Tonight, we're featuring my interview with actor, writer, comedian Ben Stiller. And we're going to lay bare his inner geek. You're going to learn stuff about him you never knew before. Like how much street cred he's got just on Star Trek alone. Not only that, he starred in the film Night at the Museum, which took place here at this museum where everything came to life, literally. So, let's do this. Yeah. We introduce my co-host, Chuck Nice. Hey. Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I have a, a Charles Liu, friend, colleague, yeah. Charles Liu. So Charles, he's a fellow astrophysicist. Uh, he's a professor at the City University of New York in Staten Island. And so I bring in Charles because he can geek out in ways that I cannot, I'm not worthy. My delight at being here, Neil, exceeds the boundaries of space and time. Is that not impossible? <laughs> not for me. We're, yeah, there you go. So now we know Ben Stiller. He's a, a pop culture icon. Absolutely. Yes. Right? Given the movies, he, he, mm -hmm. he did There's Something About Mary. You remember that one? Yes. Uh, he also did Meet the Parents. Yes. There's a trilogy there. Mm -hmm. did Zoolander. And okay. Dodgeball. Oh, Dodgeball. Okay. Dodgeball. I forgot about Dodgeball. Okay. So, so <laughs> why, do, why do we have him? Why do I interview him on the show? Well, he came through town. And I just wanted to make sure I nabbed him because I knew that he, he has a soft geek underbelly. Oh. Yeah. And on Star Talk, we lay that bare because that's how we roll. So, so this museum actually, it turned out, played an important role in his life. Let's find out how and why. Check it out. I grew up about four blocks from here on 84th Street, Riverside Drive. Okay. So this is my neighborhood. And being here, actually being here with you in this place. At the American Museum of Natural History. At the, yeah, at the Planetarium, the Natural History Museum. Just for me, it's like this is, feels very close to just my, my own DNA as a child. You know, just I loved coming We all came here. here as a kid. Yeah, yeah. And I loved the stars and astronomy and the idea of it. And I, I just wasn't a great math student. So, and I, and I never really followed through with it. Okay. Um, but I did have a great science teacher ironically, since I wasn't a good science student, who's my favorite teacher that I ever had at school, where I went to school at uh, Calhoun, which is on 81st Street here. And uh, that science teacher's name is John Rader. Was we always remember the names of our favorite teachers. Yeah. No, you remember because they make a difference. And he had a genuine love of science, and that was what I got, was that he was really excited by all this stuff. He um, encouraged us just to be creative in the sciences and for our paper he said just do you know do it on something that that you find you know interesting in the solar system or whatever so instead of writing a paper about the moon which is what i chose my friend peter swan and i uh wrote a song called man and the moon that we uh Very creative recorded, and he gave us an a on it yeah and it was about man and the moon and um basically that was it, it was man and the moon moon and the man where did it all begin? How did it all begin? <laughs> that's the lyric. That's, uh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, what, I like the rhyme. Yeah. And, and what he had to do to literarily to make the rhyme. And hooray for Mr. Raider, the teacher, who allowed Ben to learn the material that was appropriate for him and bring it forward. In the way he wanted to do it. In the way he wanted yeah. and needed to do it. Good for him. And that's what education really is. And it's not only what happens in the classroom, he came to this museum. This right. museum is a teaching experience unto itself. Right. The American Museum of Natural History, mm -hmm. all the great cities in yeah. the world have museums such as this. A natural history museum, you've got the history of life. Here we got the planetarium and the history of the universe as part of it. And I love Dis and my paleontology colleagues because they got all their dinosaur <laughs> bones up on display. And I say, one of our asteroids took them out 65 million years ago. So we win, <laughs> right? So, we do. And I was inspired by a first visit to the Hayden Planetarium. Mm. Now, of course, human beings created that show and created the exhibits. But the moment when I said, the universe is calling me, I was in the Hayden Planetarium, looking up to the night sky as presented to me. And so let me just ask quickly, in your visit to this museum or any mm -hmm. others, is there some museum memory that you have? It just blends in with all my other it's educational your total, experiences. your total knowledge. How about you? The Museum of Sex. Really? 
Changed my life, man. Really? You learn how? You learn? Changed my life. You learned life. how? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I was like, wait a After minute, you can years. do that? <laughs> <laughs> wow! <laughs> well, because Ben still grew up near this museum, this museum ended up par part of his life. And he folded it into his creativity. And in the film, A Night at the Museum, the creatures come to life. And so I had to ask him about just where that all came from. Let's check it out. First, congratulations on the success of that film. Now, thanks. Can, can I speak candidly about the film? Sure. The film was way better than I think it deserved to be. This interview's over. <laughs> no, no, what I mean is, well, no, uh, let, me, let, me okay, okay. let me explain. Let me explain. I'm explain. It's like someone tells you the premise. It's like, no, this is going to be stupid. No. No, the animals come to life. The bo No. But I have to watch it anyway because I'm an employee of this institution. <laughs> right. So we attended the premiere here at our auditorium, and it's like, this is hilarious. And my gosh, I, I have fully bought into this premise. So you made it work. Right. Well, thank you. Holy cow. So, so this is why you are you and I am me, okay? <laughs> when I... When they told me the premise, I thought, that's the coolest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> this is my dream, okay? <laughs> Astrophysicist. Good. I'm actor. glad I'm glad you so, did yeah, it. Yeah, no, I really was I grew up on the Upper West Side. So for me, as I was thinking when I read the movie, as if I was ten years old, this would be really cool. Right? And 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 then I was also thinking, oh wow, I think this is really cool because it's sort of like a fantasy that I always had to be able because I came here I, and, and you actually thought of real things and trying to solve real problems. I thought, wow, wouldn't it be cool if, you know, the narwhal in, in the hall of... Ocean Life. Ocean, yeah. Ocean Life Hall, you know, came to life. And what would that be like? <laughs> so how did you feel about the premise? Uh, I think, to be honest, that that premise is a horror film for most children. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm very, I will venture to say that if I were to poll the audience right now and ask them if the things in the other room came to life, would you think that was cool? <laughs> Sitting right here right now? No, I don't think you would. <laughs> I like the premise a great deal. Uh -huh. The basic point, this museum literally did what good teachers do bring a subject that's otherwise stuffy and still to life. To life. A proper use of the word literal. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. So many of us. He do. better. He's an astrophysicist. English majors out there, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and uh, just to, in, in the interest of disclosure, uh, some of the exhibits portrayed in the film we just don't have here. Mm -hmm. We don't have an Egyptian wing. Oh. Uh, we don't have Civil War soldiers, oh. this sort of thing. But that was okay because the rest of it, got the, the spirit and the soul of what goes on right. here. Right. And really now, now when, when the museum is about to close and the, the announcement comes on, it's in like nine languages, and people are kind of wondering, I say, if you stay here too late... <laughs> Throw the bone. <laughs> Where do you think the paleontologists get their extra bones? <laughs> you know? <laughs> they're, missing a, they're missing a bone? <laughs> hey, we need a femur. I believe your femur will do just fine. <laughs> So it turns out the, the museum attendance spiked after that film. Really? And people awesome. came in, they wanted to see the Easter Island head, which was chewed gum in the film. If you haven't seen the film, this all sounds completely stupid to you. <laughs> but that somehow they made it work, and it was charming, and it was funny. And to this day, uh, we did it beforehand, but they got very popular. We have um, sleepovers at the museum. Oh, really? Yeah. For people who, who think who, that stuff is going to come to life. <laughs> for, for people who are not completely freaked out by the premise of the animals coming to life. What they do, they turn off the lights in the dinosaurs, and they give you flashlights. Oh, that's... So you get sort of extra shadowing. Because uh, as you move with the flashlight, then the shadow oh, yeah. moves behind it. Oh, yeah, because there's nothing scary about a big, giant shadow of a Tyrannosaurus Rex <laughs> as a kid. Yeah. Well, Sleep tight, Johnny. <laughs> well, what Ben did in Night of the Museum was make it not scary. And in a sense, all yeah, the millions yeah. of right, kids right who now watch it today are not afraid of the dark in the museum and not afraid of things coming to right. life. Rather, they're enjoying it. They're mm -hmm. looking forward to it. And, and you know, I, I worry that it can be... Especially in modern times, we can take science for granted. Yes. You know, somebody's out there figuring this stuff out and presenting it to you. And I think so many of us think it's just always there. Yeah. You know, I once put a calculation in, in, in one of my tweets, and someone said, uh, what wiki page did you get that from? Oh. I said, I, I, 
you know, wh what app did you use? I said, I used the brain app. Okay, <laughs> like, 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 you can calculate this. That's what I did. And my community of people actually write wiki pages. And people have to realize that this stuff comes from somewhere. You know, we do take science for, for granted. And so here's what I did. I took to the streets as our uh, sidewalk science correspondent. Oh, who gave you that title? You know... I kind of made it up. <laughs> science sidewalk, sidewalk correspondent. science correspondent. That's cool. Yeah. Okay. You know, I just really wanted to go out and see exactly how much the public appreciates science. All right, let's check it out. What scientific advancement can you not live without every day? I'm not going to say cell phones. That's the easiest answer. Okay. And everyone's become so dependent. So Very good. Electricity. Nice. Electricity. Which, by the way, cell phones would not work without it. What scientific advancement do you think you cannot live without? Frozen custard. Well, I'm kind of an agriculture nerd, so I think tractors are pretty important. Tractors? Everything around you is... It's science. Yeah, exactly. And see, even though I was going to go with toilet paper, let's talk about science, baby. What do you think is the greatest scientific advancement in the history of humankind? I would say space travel. The wheel? the wheel. That is a good one. A tractor. Uh, once again with a tractor? <laughs> is there anything more important than science? Say love, I guess. Really? See, but you weren't convinced. You know science is better than love. Science is more important. Oh, well. If you say tractor, I swear to God. <laughs> is there anything more important than science? Beer. Beer. There's the answer, people. I'm sorry. We got to cut this off. Beer. <laughs> 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 Coming up next, we'll get back to my interview with Ben Stiller and find out how much of a total geek he really is when Star Talk continues. <laughs> Welcome back to Star Talk, right here in New York City. Featuring my interview with Ben Stiller, and we're trying to find out how much of a geek is he really? Turns out he, he's a huge Star Trek fan. And if you're a Star Trek yes. fan, that gets you geek street cred right off the top. Oh, yeah. Let's find out how. The chemistry of the cast was amazing. The stories were always interesting. And as a kid, you know, like they just sometimes they were funny, sometimes they were more serious. Uh, and uh, I don't know, I just love the show. I love the show. And so, so this is a, a little bit of a geek underbelly yeah. you got going there. Well, I mean, I don't know if it's that much of an underbelly. It might <laughs> just be an exposed <laughs> Fully <belly. Yeah>. raw and <laughs> exposed. Yeah, it's not that <laughs> hidden. But, uh, I mean, I didn't realize it was sort of geeky to like Star Trek or to be into that stuff. That's probably the definition of someone who is a geek. You not knowing. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, just, you actually think it's cool. Um, but my friends and I, we loved it. And I actually just found... I got the Star Trek, the Starfleet technical manual when the show was out where you could... <laughs> Geek alert. <laughs> he, he didn't even... He didn't even pause. He didn't even <laughs> wonder whether he, that should just come out of his mouth. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I got. I picked up the Star Trek technical manual. Yeah. Of course. It's yeah. actually very cool because it has blueprints of the Enterprise and, you know, okay, there's no way of... No. <laughs> You're okay. making you, me feel like a no, geek? No, no, Come you on, are man. at home. No, I don't mean, no, no, forgive me. You are at home. All right. You are with <laughs> Thank you. I ones. thought I was with a light. <laughs> this is a safe space. Yeah. It's a safe space um, for the geek of I'm sure for real scientists, Star Trek is like a funny sort of little diversion. But, you know, for me, it's as close as I got to, you know, to actual science. But the, uh, yeah, so they did, I mean, it's interesting, though, isn't it, that they would make up a whole book that was fake blueprints of a ship that never existed and... Right? It's yeah, no, I, I, that I agree. Mythology that gets created around this stuff. And you were talking, we were talking before about how a certain mythology and fiction comes out of first being basing it in some sort of fact. Yeah, yeah. And if it's close enough to being real, then there's enough of an anchor for creative people, technologists, scientists, artists, to say, I want that in my future. Sure. So did, did, you, did you glean anything from this technical manual at the time? Um, well, I literally just found it recently, like in a box of old stuff, and of course I just I got very emotional, you know, because it's my childhood, and I was like, oh, my my Starfleet technical manual. Um, but uh, I mean, it's what I found interesting was that there was so much detail put into something that was totally fictional, 
Um, but I think we all want to kind of believe these, you know, these mythologies, and, and that's what's kind of you, you invest in, whether it's any any science fiction. I think, you know, and, and I think Star Trek did sort of because he was telling stories that were based on what was going on at the time, culturally relevant. Yeah, definitely. That it, it felt that connection was there. So Charles, yes. you're you are Star Trek geek in chief, and so did you have a Starfleet manual? I got it out of the library. Okay. Nice. Like, that's Geek Squared, right? Yeah. <laughs> How about you, Chuck? <laughs> yes, I have one, too. <laughs> yes! <laughs> okay, so, so now you're, like, on level ground with, with, with Ben Stiller. I but liked Ben before. Now I really like him. <laughs> but, you know, he was talking about the social relevance of Star Trek, and it's so true. At that time especially, uh, never mind things like racial issues... Uh, yes. social, people getting along, and anti-war. At that time, right Very during the Cold so. War in Vietnam, there are a series of episodes that address directly uh, a hope for a better so there's, humanity. There's a huge cultural tapestry from which to draw storylines if you're going to make commentary. Absolutely. Yes. And uh, let us remind ourselves, of course, that Star Trek just enjoyed its 50th anniversary. Yes, yes absolutely. Absolutely. Right. absolutely. So, hearing that he owns a Starship manual, we only just scratched the surface Excellent. of Ben Stiller's <laughs> geekitude. The, I, I'm telling you, the dude is borderline obsessed. <laughs> Check it out. Tropic Thunder, which is the movie I directed, there's, um, in Matthew McConaughey's office, he plays an agent. Uh, I got my Spock ears in there as part of his, like in his office on his desk. Oh, what do you mean yeah. your Spock ears? Uh, the Spock ears that I purchased at auction, Neil. <laughs> Uh, that I proudly purchased at auction uh, a <laughs> number of years ago. So you own an original set of Spock ears? I do, from, yeah, I think from the second season. Wow. And, uh, and, I actually, and then you put those on set. Now, you realize it's Hollywood. They could just make a prop. You, you realize that. No, no, well, I'll keep going with this. I also uh, put my Gorn head... You have uh, that I own. You have a Gorn head. The Gorn head from the arena episode in that same. I can tell you a couple stories about this. Okay. The Gorn. This is the lizard creature. That's right. That, the Gorn. That that Captain Kirk fights. That's right. I I have the Gorn head, which I also bought at auction, and the Gorn outfit, his uniform. Oh, now I'm jealous. See, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna, so I want. So the Gorn head. head. So the Gorn head was actually in. I put that in the office too. Wait, wait. Just pa pause for a minute. Just the very phrase. I own a Gorn head. <laughs> That, that, <laughs> I own a Gorn head. Those five words either mean absolutely nothing or mean everything. I mean, exactly. Right. That defines who you are as a person. <laughs> and that's like some sort of a Rorschach test yes. for personality. Amazing. And, for okay. What your values are in life. But I've never put the Gorn head on, just to let you know. I'm not that weird. Okay. Um, you, but, you, you draw your line. <laughs> But the cool thing for me was that Leonard Nimoy did spot the Spock ears when he saw the movie. Okay. Which was, and reached out to me, which was probably one of the best moments of my life. Did you get him to sign it, or was it? Was it? He, uh, you know what, he, he, I told him what, he said, did I spot some, some ears in that scene? I was like, yes, sir, you did. I, there were your ears that I purchased. You didn't start the conversation, I'm not worthy. I'm I, not basically, <laughs> I was just... You know, I was a mess. Bumbling. Really. Yeah, I was very excited because he really is one of my favorite people mm -hmm. and, and the fact that I got a chance to meet him and that he noticed the ears. And uh, and I said, yes, I'm a huge fan. And I, I told him that I also had his um, tunic from the pilot episode. And <laughs> he said, oh, well, okay, um, you know, give me your address. I want to send you something. And he sent me a set of his ears from the first, uh, from the Star Trek movie. From the movie? Okay. And that basically is like my... My my life could end. There it is. So that's wow. Okay, that's, that's why I'm that's, retiring. That's, you're you're done. <laughs> Bucket list complete. <laughs> wow. I just love how uh, no matter how much or who you are, you have to be very sheepish when you say like I have Spock ears. No. Like yeah, he was like, yeah. and I have Spock ears. No, no. But I told him he's in a safe space. The the only thing I would ask is, Mr. Stiller, may I please put on the Gorn hat? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm going to be honest. When he said that, I didn't understand that. Why do you buy a Gorn head and not wear it? I'm not only wearing it. I'm saying to my wife, look, you're going to have to close your eyes because I'm wearing this Gorn head. <laughs> oh. oh, no, 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 no. I tell my wife, 
Honey, take a look. I'm wearing a Gorn hit. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, you know, ears are they're an interesting marker. Yeah. And I think if you otherwise have a humanoid-looking creature, do you give them three eyes? Generally not. Mm -hmm. Do you give them a? Do you put their nose on their cheek? No. You just sort of give them new kind of ears. It seems. It seems to be the way that you can uh, make use of your very gorgeous actor uh, without screwing up their face. Oh, oh, is that okay? You know what I no, mean? That uh, makes sense. I have a the, friend Sarah who that's her that's her philosophy on why all aliens have weird know, ears. Weird ears, mm -hmm. as opposed to you well, know, plus in the in the mammal. You know, among mammals, ears vary greatly. Yeah. yeah. The floppy ears, pointy ears, and ears that stick out, and ears that can aim. Yeah. You know, so, so, so that's within our, um, uh, that's within our ability to accept. Right. Yes. And, and let's face it, in the 1960s, costume making technology only went so far. Evidenced right. by the Gorn head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's you know, the sound they made. <laughs> yes, but I really. <laughs> That was very good. Did you like that? I yeah. loved it. Which, yes. by the way, he spoke into a translator, and he would go, <laughs> and be like, Kirk, let me tell you something. It was great. Uh, a I'm translator sorry. provided by the Metrons. You're right. Was trying to prevent an interstellar war. Because it was actually like an interstellar cable show. That, uh, all right. Here's 100 <laughs> oh bucks. My like God. I said, go, the room. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe we just did that. So coming up, we continue my interview with Ben Stiller. And we break down the very hard science. We're back on Star Talk, featuring my interview with Ben Stiller, actor, comedian, writer. And I, I have to call him out. In one of his films, there's a bit of scientific inaccuracy in a really important scene. And I had to, I had to raise that issue with him. Let's check it out. In Zoolander, there's a scene where Hansel's walking down the runway, and then he pauses, sticks his hand in his pants, right. and nobody knows why. And he's reaching around. Why is he doing this? And your character says, why is he sticking his hand in his pants? <laughs> <laughs> and then a few seconds later, he comes out, and there's his underwear. Right. And I, 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 I must alert you that that is topologically impossible, yeah. what he did. But I give him credit for even... Go in there. Right. But there is, there is a, a topological way to approach it, right? There is. In fact, you can remove your underwear without taking off your pants. But it, it's a, he has to, like, you need very stretchy underwear right. to pull one side around your foot right. and then back up, and then it slides across and comes out right. the other side. But maybe he did that really quickly and we didn't see it. Oh, at a point where the camera pulled away. Maybe. And then or just it happened so fast. <laughs> so, <laughs> love it. <laughs> love it. So I, I just briefly mentioned topology there. That's a branch of mathematics uh -huh. that thinks deeply about uh, surfaces and how the surfaces connect or interconnect mm -hmm. and how you make shapes. Right. And it's, it's a fun branch of math. And oh, if, I, if I were a mathematician, I think I'd be a topologist. Yes, well, you know what? Here's the funny thing, Neil. When I found out about the topological reference that you made, I felt that I had to be able to demonstrate that it is possible. <laughs> what? Yes. Because if I do <laughs> the, the right thing, I can do it. I forgot I was wearing these this laundry day. <laughs> what? What? What is on the front? What? What is on the front of that uh, that underwear? Here, man, just ah. Uh, what? Uh, because... what? What am I doing on the front of your? <laughs> Wait, first of all, they're red, and I think the word for these is panties. And I'm just realizing here, this isn't Saturn. What is it? Based on the coloration and how thin the ring is. Yeah. This is, in fact, Uranus. <laughs> <laughs> Well, just be glad it's not Uranus. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> Are there any Klingons orbiting? Oh, jeez. <laughs> Give me my underwear. <laughs> I'm sorry, bro. So, so let me ask you guys, because I think about this all the time. Where, where would you place the threshold of science accuracy where after which they cross that line, they go into storytelling? 
storytelling abandoning the science accuracy. You, you have a you have a line. That you I have, have a line, and that is completely. You know this based on scientific research. That's fact. If you don't know it, it becomes fiction. It's a very clear line. Scientific knowledge has been tested. No, no, wait, wait. Is that answering my question? I'm asking you. I, there's a science fiction story. How yeah. much science should they put in correctly? Oh, and how much? And so where's the line? The, in that, if you're going to call something science fiction, you don't need any science at all. Hmm. It doesn't have to be. Because what we're talking about at that point is just creating a world that is sufficiently different. In a world. <laughs> <laughs> All we need to do to create science fiction is to create some sort of world environment where it's sufficiently different from our own that we can start commenting on our own in a distant, detached way. But, but, it, what, but I'll say is what makes good science fiction is the more science you have in your science fiction the you, better your science fiction I, is. I'm thinking you anchor it in what is real, then step to where your fantasy takes you. A lot of people think this, but let me give a counterexample. Wait, wait, and let me leave. But you give your counterexample after I give you a quote from Mark Twain. Mm. Mark Twain was a science fiction fan? First, get your facts straight, <laughs> then distort them at your leisure. <laughs> nice. Okay. Mark so, Twain. Mark Twain said that. Mm. Star Wars for example, okay. is patently unscientific in literally every way. <laughs> the fact that it has planets and spaceships is about the only accurate science in Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> if just one of those X-wings would actually go to warp speed while it was sitting in orbit around a planet, it would wipe out the atmosphere of that planet. And yet they do this all the time. Right? That's just one tiny example. Why do X-wings make the same sound when they're whizzing around in space as they when are flying in an I atmosphere? I pose that very same question. These things don't matter in the quality of Star Wars as a science fiction mythos. It is a beautiful, brilliant thing. As so long you're telling as me I overreact system. when I comment on No, 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 no. When somebody says that they're doing science fiction, then you can suspend all disbelief, and it's okay if they get it wrong. All right, so here, so let me, let me meet you halfway. Sure. If you're going to make science fiction and you want to create a world, let that world be internally consistent like in it. whatever rules you create for it, no matter how different they are from our own. So yes. don't violate your own rules. Don't violate yes. your own rules. Right? I am happy with that. Okay. All right. <laughs> all right. Well, I am so glad that we settled <laughs> We settled <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, moving on to other works of Ben Stiller, I made a cameo appearance in Zoolander, too. No. Really? Yes, I did. It was filmed what? on location in Rome, and I flew to Rome for this, except while it was on location in Rome, it was in a studio in Rome. So they could have done it here, but everybody was in Rome, so I had to go to Rome. Mm. And we wonder why movie budgets are so big. <laughs> and one of my scenes was on location with Owen Wilson and Katy Perry. And the very last shot of the film is me doing Zo Derek Zoolander's famous Blue Steel. Oh, God. Oh. I'm in this movie. <laughs> awesome. Okay, my earlier scene has very loose cosmology in it. Okay? okay. This is a throwaway at the end. And a wonderful throwaway it is. Okay, but the, my, my, I would ask just, should I keep doing this if I'm asked? Yes. Yeah. Because, I, because is it really, why? Are you kidding me? <laughs> I would do that for no reason at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, I need reason. I, 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 need, I, I don't I need, need a reason to do, I, look at that. Yes, are you kidding me? So if you, if you look at this frame by frame, in one of the frames there are like moons and planets coming out <laughs> from the thing. So there isn't a, a cosmological reference you to it. You don't need one. No need for a cosmological reference with that. That, my friend, is called fabulousness. <laughs> <laughs> you absolutely should keep doing this. Okay. And the reason is, to me, very simple. Every human being has a combination of the serious and the excited and the crazy. And if this is you, you just do it. That it's is simple. Awesome. All right, I'll take it to heart. Thank that you for, is awesome. Thank you for that. Well, up next, Ben Stiller helps us break down what might be the science of comedy on Star Talk. <laughs> Welcome back to Star Talk. We're featuring my interview with Ben Stiller. And I don't know if. 
unless you've been living on another planet in another dimension, uh, he has surely made you laugh at some point in his career in your life. And so I had to ask him, is there, is, is there a science to comedy? Is there some kind of a formula? Let's check it out. Um, you know what? I think it's an instinctual thing that does have some sort of math to it in some way. <laughs> okay, what equation? I'll write it down. But no, <laughs> you know, there is like, there's the old rule of three, you know, with a joke, where you like have what a setup. Mean? Where if there's like something funny, it's the third thing that's funny. You know, like you say the two, you say two regular things, and then the third thing is the funny thing. Okay, you don't. It's not um, the eighth thing. <laughs> no, right? Yeah, and that, and that is like a rhythm thing. It's like a timing thing it, it, that is, I think, just is an instinctual thing. Probably the way instinctually you gravitate to. Um, Good word, gravitate. Yeah, gravitate <laughs> towards uh, mathematics, or you know, or, or or you know how those equations work. How you have there's a, sense a way to think that. about it, a yeah, way to set and, it up. And I think that that spurred your interest in it because you had a, a knack for it and, and an understanding of it just instinctually. And I think that's the way it is with comedy, that you could probably break down and go, yeah, that actually does have some sort of a, an equation to it. So, Chuck, is comedy instinctual to you, or do you, do you, or is it formulaic at some level? You know, um, yes, both. <laughs> <laughs> really? No, seriously. No, the truth is, it's both. Some, I, I write material, and then I go on stage uh, with the full intent, if that's not working, to abandon that material, because I trust that I'm funny enough to make it work. Uh, so some of it is timing, some of it is instinctual, um, and there are different ways to actually create jokes. Like, familiar associations coupled with surprise is something that's very familiar to everyone. You know, if, 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 if you bring about familiar associations and then you interject something that's surprising, people will most likely laugh, you know. So, or at least react. Or at least yeah. react, yeah. you know, right. So, and, and believe it or not, that's the... That's the biggest conundrum of being a comedian is that you write in a vacuum, uh, but you find out if you're funny uh, in public. So you don't know if you're funny until you actually Until you're do not it. funny. Until you're not funny. <laughs> right. And that is it. So comedians suffer from delusions because you think you're funny when you are not. Okay. That is what makes you You can think you're funny when you're not. Yeah. No, you just think you're funny when you're not. <laughs> <laughs> well, so here at Star Talk, we keep a Rolodex of like experts on stuff. Of course. And we got somebody who thinks about just these sorts of questions academically. Ooh. We got just a guy, okay? His name is Scott Weems. He's a cognitive neuroscientist who studies the science, the science of what makes us laugh. Ooh. And I think we've got him standing by right now on video call. Scott, hello. Welcome to Star Talk. So, so you've, you've been eavesdropping on this conversation. Do you agree with Ben Stiller that there's some, at least some kinds of comedy are formulaic? Well, I think there's definitely a science to comedy. Um, I'm not sure there's a formula in the sense that you can define this will be funny and this won't. It takes practice like any other art. So as a cognitive neuroscientist, presumably you know which parts of the brain get stimulated by what kind of jokes. I do. I mean, people have been put in scanners like MRI or tools like that and, and then studied while they're like looking at cartoons or listening to jokes and things like that. And there are certain parts of the brain that are generally active. The anterior cingulate seems to be like the, the kind of the center for resolving conflict and getting jokes, which tells us there's something in common for those two things. Yes, because when you are funny, that's a very good way to diffuse conflict. Uh, when... You know, it kept me from getting beat up quite a bit. Okay, is that right? And so, so are, is laughing and humor strictly human, or are there other animals out there who, who can do this? Uh, no, we're definitely not special in terms of humor, in the sense that lots of animals laugh. Um, we know that apes laugh. That's a relatively straightforward one. And the more similar their vocal cords are to ours, the more the laughter actually sounds like us. But wait, but what uh, are they laughing at? Uh, it, depends on, it depends on what you think is funny if you're an ape. I mean, apes, They're not laughing because they have a stand-up comedian in front of them. They're laughing for what, what makes an ape laugh? Well, let's just say uh, we're talking about uh, animals that throw their own poop. 
<laughs> You're actually right on with that. Yeah, uh, yeah. so there's actually a very famous story of Washoe, a chimpanzee who was taught sign language. And there was one day she was sitting on her handler's shoulders and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, she just peed, just peed on his shoulders. And he looked up, obviously, you know, covered in urine. This was not a pleasant thing. And she was making the sign language sign for laugh, for funny. So I think if you are an ape, most of your humor does have to do with pee and feces well, uh, because there aren't stand-up comedians. Who knew there was an R. Kelly in the chimpanzee world? <laughs> <laughs> Scott, we got to end this now. But thanks for, thanks for checking in with us. And, and the day you actually write out a formula, I want to be the first one you call. No, please make him the second one you call because I do this for a living. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Scott, thanks again. <laughs> Thank you. right here at the American Museum of Natural History, featuring my interview with Ben Stiller. He's a comedian, and you think he's fun because you see him in the movies and on TV. He's just that fun in real life. Check it out. Is there an, an impression that you can do of someone that could just be fun? Was there? God, I am so bad. I'm not good with the impression. Uh, you must have been able to do Captain no. Kirk. Don't no, tell me. No, I, I do a bad Captain Kirk. Can we just bad. try it? No. <laughs> I can do... I'll just, I can do Captain Kirk uh, in a fight. Okay, I can do Captain Kirk in a fight, okay? So you have to bear hug me, right? Okay. Like you're trying to squeeze me All like right. you're a Klingon or Should something. Should I pretend or do it for yeah, real? Yeah, no, do it for real, and okay. then I'll do what, how okay. Captain okay. Kirk can okay. get out of it. Okay, okay, so ready? Just grab, grab me. Okay, right. Ah. Ah. <laughs> that was how he would get out of something. <laughs> Like, You're right. <laughs> That's what he did every time. All right. Just, just a, a k double karate chop That's right. to the shoulders. That was that awesome. That was awesome. That was awesome. Wait, so there were other powers that were expressed in Star Trek. So there was the Vulcan mind meld. Yes. And uh, Charles, just tell us what that was real quick. The Vulcans are very telepathic species. They could literally project thoughts into other people as long as they touched them in the nose, in the forehead, and on the cheek all at the same time. Yes. Because those are the erotic zones of Vulcans. <laughs> <laughs> and there's also the Vulcan nerve pinch. Yes. Which I attempted ah! throughout. That was it. Chuck has the power. <laughs> Chuck has the force. That was either the Vulcan neck pinch or I'm a televangelist. I'm not sure. <laughs> so, Charles, yes. I, I spent a lot of my childhood trying to paralyze people with a Vulcan neck pinch. Ooh. And it never worked. Well, and I, I got a really strong grip at one point. Yeah. I can squeeze like 240 pounds wow. with my hand. I, you, you, all you have to do take a scale and squeeze, okay? Wow. And you can see what is registered on the scale. So there it was. So I went, did this on people's, and I tied here and here and here. Nobody ever dropped. Well, that's just because Vulcans are even stronger than humans. Yes. They're like three or four times stronger. So if you could have nerve pinched, say, 800 pounds, it would have worked every time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Because you would have crushed his clavicle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'd have broke his clavicle with no problem. Right. Yeah. That's why I do something called the Vulcan nut punch. And <laughs> works every time. The Vulcan nut punch. <laughs> I've just been notified right now on the show, it's time for Cosmic Queries. A yes. Fan All right. This is where we solicit questions from our fan base. Mm -hmm. And the topic at hand today for these questions? Yes. Is all about bringing science to life. See, okay. Yes, bringing yes. Science Just as life. this museum did in Ben Stiller's Night at the Museum. So what do you have? Awesome. So let's go with at Keith Garris from Twitter says, if you could pick one exhibit from any museum to come to life and interact with for a night, what would it be, Neil? That's easy. Yeah? In the planetarium, uh -huh. if we show a black hole, right. I want to bring that out of the sky and put it right in here in the exhibit. <laughs> right on. Let me just say... Just keep your distance. <laughs> <laughs> Next. <laughs> uh, right. This is from Joshua A. Mikhail from uh, Phoenix, Arizona. says, if aliens were to visit Earth and go to the American Museum of Natural History, which department or exhibit do you think they might find most interesting? The Hall of Biodiversity. Really? No question about it. The, there is laid bare the entire range and scope and spectrum of how matter has found a way to become alive here in this museum. And it is laid all in full view. Okay. So, so we would say, here's what we got on our planet. 
Got now, you. what do you have? What on do you yours? have on yours? Right, yo, that's a there that's, you go. So now, uh, Septarshi Mandal from Davis, California, says, "Dear Dr. Tyson, oh how formal! Uh, has there ever been a scientifically inaccurate museum exhibit which was later corrected as more accurate science came to be discovered?" That happens all the time. Really? All the time. What's more typical? It's not that something is inaccurate that mm -hmm. can happen, mm -hmm. but what's more typical is. The museum exhibit has kind of lost why it matters because something matters more than that oh, later on. Right. Because something, we know it better than what was known back then. So we can add precision. So you got to redo the exhibit. So any museum worth, it, worth anything has got to be a living display of the science that they communicate because science is a never ending frontier. Cool. Austin Belusio from San Jose, California, wants to know this. What is your opinion on places such as the Creation Museum, who showcases the Bible as literal knowledge? Should it be considered a museum? In this country of ours, which is, we at least tell ourselves, has freedom of speech, and we celebrate the plurality of who and what we are, that would include belief systems. I personally have no problems with any kind of museum you want to put up. Mm -hmm. The problem arises when you take something that is a belief system mm -hmm. and then want to impose that belief system on the plurality of your society. Gotcha. That is very different from taking something that is objectively true mm -hmm. and sharing that with the country. Science and its methods and tools establish what is objectively true. And that means it's true whether or not you believe in it. But if you have a creation science museum, it's not actually science. It's a belief system put into a museum form. Fine. But now if you're going to legislate that way and you want others to think that that is the truth rather than your belief system, that is the beginning of the end of an informed democracy. So you're welcome to your belief system. You yourself are welcome. It's a personal it truth. It's, it's a not personal a truth. It's not a universal truth. Exactly. Gotcha. Exactly. <laughs> That was a damn good answer. That's a damn good answer, my friend. <laughs> Up next, my good friend Bill Nye, the science guy, has thoughts about bringing science to life when Star Talk returns. Bringing space and science down to Earth. You're listening to Star Talk. We're back on Star Talk. Featuring my interview with comedian, actor, director, Ben Stiller. And he had some parting thoughts on the role of humor in the universe. Let's check it out. In reality, I think there's humor within serious situations. Just life has humor within it. Mm -hmm. And that really makes something feel more real. Even That's if. how I feel about the universe. I think it's, it's dripping with humor. Yes. It's, the universe is a hilarious place. Like describing how you die when you fall into a black hole. That's right. hilarious. I'm just... <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah, sure. <laughs> the fact that as big toothed as T Rex was, it doesn't do a damn thing when the asteroid comes. <laughs> you could, he could be the right. top of the food chain and you're still wiped out by an asteroid. I mean, those are bigger questions in the universe, I think, in terms of that people get involved in their own problems and, and just get focused on all these issues in their life because they're afraid of dealing with the bigger issue of, like, why are we all here? What is this all about? <laughs> And, you know, those are the questions of the universe. <laughs> what? 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 Oh, Would I just, you agree that the universe just, is dripping with humor? I, I think. Oh, of course, yeah. Like, you know, the dead T-Rex, man. That's so funny. <laughs> it, it's filled with humor, you're right. We, you thought, agree? we thought this was all this way, and then it's like, you're totally wrong. Ah, ah, ah. But, 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 but wait, wait, but, but is it, do you think it's a coping mechanism? Yes. To 100%. deal with certain existential uncertainties? Absolutely. If we did not laugh at ourselves, we would cry. Because there's so much that we still don't know. Well, before we wrap this up, i got to catch up with my, my guy Bill Nye. Okay? This dispatch comes from right here at the American Museum of Natural History, the setting of Ben Stiller's film, Night at the Museum. So let's check out my boy Bill. So how do we bring science to life? Well, this is a Tyrannosaurus, like Rexy from Night at the Museum. That's one way. Museums are full of artifacts that tell us about the history of humankind and the history of the Earth. Now, the Tyrannosaurus has lived about 65 million years ago. And as iconic as the Tyrannosaurus is, 
We've only found 15 reasonably complete skeletons. But let me tell you something, my friends. 15 is infinitely more than zero. We know that these animals once roamed the earth because we found their bones. And paleontologists have thought long and hard about how to arrange the bones so that they appear the way they would have in nature when the animal was alive. And I'll tell you, when I'm here and I look at the skeleton, it's easy for me to imagine a walking, talking, stalking dinosaur. It's as though these bones bring these animals to life. <laughs> so do you have any parting thoughts about bringing science to life? Uh, don't do it by trying to show people the underwear that you are uh, currently wearing. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, Charles, any parting thoughts? As a professor, as an educator, it is my goal to bring science to life every day to everyone who's willing to learn. Something like Night at the Museum, which Ben and his colleagues did so well, really helps us in making that happen. When I think about bringing science to life, I mean, I'm a scientist, and it's not really a scientist's job to bring science to life. It's our job to discover how the world works using the methods and tools of science. And so that forces me to reflect on what it actually takes to bring science to life. And I'll tell you what it takes. It takes a system in our culture, in our society, that makes it clear that science is everywhere. It is a part of our lives in practically every way that matters. And there's no requirement that everyone becomes a scientist. I don't want that world. That would be a boring world. No. When I try to encourage science interest, my actual goal is to enable everybody in our culture to embrace science for what it is. And if some among them are artists, then they can take the science that they learn and fold it into their creativity and create a masterpiece of artwork, a sculpture, a movie, a novel. And then, then, science has become the artist's muse. Only then can we claim that science is part of culture the way it always should be. That's a parting thought from the cosmic perspective.